which is a collaboration of the ICE and IGB team here within Clarion Gaming, and also an extension of the uh, similar physical uh, initiative that I hope many of you attended uh, over the last few years at ICE London and Excel. This is also organized uh, on the occasion of the uh, UK Safer Gambling Week, uh, which uh, I know you will hear more about from one of the panelists. Um, today um, is the third webinar. Uh, I hope you participated uh, in the other two on Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, which were both uh, covering issues around uh, consumer protection. We looked at uh, blanket versus individualized approaches to responsible gambling, then at advertising, marketing, uh, public perception. And the viewpoints that you heard uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday were international, as we had experts uh, from, uh, uh, from various countries in Europe. Uh, today, uh, we are going to focus uh, on, uh, on the UK. Uh, obviously, uh, consumer protection, responsible gambling are very much uh, shaping uh, or influencing the review uh, of the UK Gambling Act, which is the main theme of the webinar today. Uh, before I hand over to uh, the moderator, I, I wanted to draw your attention once again uh, to uh, a whole uh, series of uh, articles and features and podcasts as well um, that we have that we have released and will be releasing again on the occasion of the UK Safer Gambling Week. You can find them on iGamingBusiness.com. Um, and speaking of uh, podcasts as part of the coverage, uh, let me now hand over to Dan Bless, uh, who uh, will tell you more about them and also lead you through the discussion. Dan, over to you. Thanks, Eva, and good afternoon to everybody. Um, and thank you to Clarion for organising such a good event um, for Safer Gambling Week, despite the challenges of lockdown. Um, so before I introduce the session uh, and our panellists, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Daniel Bliss. I'm currently the Director of External Affairs at the national charity YGAM. I joined the charity earlier this year from the Gambling Commission. Um, and I'm also working with the IGB team to produce and host the Gambling Review podcast, um, which if you haven't listened to, um, there's my plug to go and listen to that um, over on the IGB channels. So um, let me go through our panellists today and I'll just do a quick introduction and then we'll get stuck in. So my first panellist is Bridget Simmons, OBE who is the chair of the Bettany Gaming Council, having spent 10 years leading the British Peer, Beer and Pub Association as chief executive. Bridget is a former trustee of Gamble Aware, and if you don't know, the Bettany Gaming Council represents over 90% of the UK's betting and gaming industry, including betting shops, online gaming businesses, bingo and casinos. Good afternoon, Bridget. Afternoon, Dan. My second panellist is Lord Foster. Um, Lord Don Foster is the chair of the Peers for Gambling Reform Group in the House of Lords. He was a Liberal Democrat MP for Bath from 1992 to 2005 and has been an active member of the Lords calling for gambling reform in recent years. He was also a member of the recent House of Lords Select Committee <laughs> on Gambling, which published a comprehensive report earlier this year. Good afternoon, Don. Afternoon, Dan. Thank you for calling my former constituency by its correct name, Bath, with the northern <laughs> pronunciation rather than what my constituents called it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thirdly is Matt Zab Cousin. So Matt Zab Cousin is the director of the Clean Up Gambling Campaign and also co-founder of Gamban. Matt was at the forefront of the successful campaign to reduce the state limits on FOBTs. Matt himself had a severe gambling addiction while in his early 20s at university and has used his experiences to campaign for change. Outside gambling, Matt has worked as spokesperson for the former Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn. So good afternoon, Matt. Good afternoon, Dan. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. And, and finally, um, we have Neil Banbury, who is the UK General Manager for the Kindred Group, where he's worked in a number of roles over the past 10 years. Kindred is an online gam gambling operator, which consists of some well-known brands, among them Unibet, Mirai Casino, 32 Red and iGame. The group offer products such as online casinos, online poker, online bingo and sports betting. So good afternoon, good afternoon Neil. Hi Dan. 
So that's um, that's the introduction. So we'll we'll crack on and we'll get stuck into it. Um, thank you all for taking your time to join the panel today. I think we should start um, the discussion by reflecting on exactly why the government is in a position where it's launching a review of the current gambling act. Um, all three major parties committed to um, a review in the last general election. So why is the review needed? Um, what currently is not working? Um, and we'll start with Bridget. Thanks, Dan. I go back to when the Gambling Act was introduced in 2005. Of course, the thinking in the parliamentary process meant that most of that thinking was done in the early two, 2000s. And of course, it actually didn't come into effect until 2007. And indeed, online companies weren't required to have a UK licence until 2014. So I, I think the world has moved on. The Betting and Gaming Council has been quite clear that we welcome a review of the Act. There's been a lot of noise. We need to respond to that noise. We've only been an organisation around for the last year. We have, I think, made considerable strands around the safer gambling agenda, which is very much for us about uh, setting standards. Um, but we would welcome a review. We will participate in it. We want something that is proportionate, that's evidence led. And there are some areas of legislation, particularly that around casinos, because some people remember when the act was actually introduced, there was an election. And so it was there was a, a negotiation right at the end of the act. And I think uh, casino legislation is particularly poor and we need to sort that out as part of it. So we welcome it. We will participate and all our members will too. Matt, do you want to pick up from there? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think as Bridget said, that the, the act was conceived of at a time where I don't think people even, most people walking around with a Nokia 3210, if they were lucky, you know, it's like the technology has moved on significantly. And I mean, before the call, we were, we were chatting and Don, Don said, when was the first iPhone launched? And it was 2007. So the legislation was conceived of in, early, in the early 2000s. And then it came into force before the first iPhone ever came out. So now I think you know everyone's got effectively got a casino in their pocket. And I think the legislation, uh, if it was written today, if the 2005 Gambling Act were written today, it wouldn't talk about limits to stakes on machines. It would talk about limits to stakes on content. And wherever that content may be accessible, whether it's on a machine or whether it's online or or a new platform we haven't really thought of yet. And I think that that's the problem with the 2005 Act. It's just, it hasn't future-proofed uh, for, for, for technological advances, for technological changes. And I think that, that is going to be one of the challenges now. It's to make sure that not only the legislation is equipped to adapt to new technology, but also the Gambling Commission has adequate resources to, uh, to, to maintain uh, oversight of these changing technologies and we've already seen the government launching the loot box consultation in parallel that's a very new form of gambling again I think we a thing we couldn't really have conceived of but also a form of gambling um, and it looks like the government's going to make that a form of gambling or at least regulate it in a similar way so there's all of these things and, and look the, the idea of affordability afford an affordability model that actually works where people who access gambling sites only lose what they can afford to I think that's within reach. I think we can actually come up with a model that works. And you know, some proposals have been put forward. I think there's something to work with there. Don, Don, over to you. Um, just following on from what Matt and, and Bridget have said, I mean, uh, those who were around at the time will know the 2005 Act uh, was introduced with the intention of significantly liberalizing gambling uh, in the United Kingdom uh, and many of the measures in that act did just that. So quite clearly, uh, since there hasn't been a review of it since then in any detail, uh, it makes a great deal of sense to review how that act worked, what have been the implications, some of them good, some of them bad, uh, and what we should be doing about it now. But it is, I think, most critical to acknowledge what Matt said which is the point that the legislation was introduced two years before the first iPhone came out. And so we've got, in effect, um, the jargon uh, describes it as analog legislation in a digital world. And when you think that now 80% of all the marketing 
for gambling companies is done online, then quite clearly we need to see whether or not we've kept up to date uh, with ensuring that there is proper regulation and legislation around online gambling, something that currently we don't have. I want to make one other point though. We will talk a lot about the gambling review, but I believe it is vitally important that we don't allow the review of the legislation, which inevitably will take a couple of years before all of the stages are gone through. We don't allow that to delay some very important work that's going on being done by the government in terms of loot boxes, by our gambling commission, and also in fairness by the industry themselves, who are increasingly stepping up to the plate, working with the commission and with the government to introduce changes. We can argue whether they go far enough, but that is all happening, and I don't want the review to be a delay to those activities. And, and Neil, anything to build on, on those points? Yeah, look, I think obviously um, it's it's widely acknowledged that the world has, has moved on a long way um, since the app came came in. Um, lots has changed, and, and I think ultimately the the situation we find ourselves in now as an industry, <clears throat> there's just a huge amount of um, uncertainty around the regulation. Um, what's going to change? When's it going to change? And I think ultimately, probably. Uh, whichever side of any debate you fall on, I think there's probably at least some consensus around the fact that we want to move to a framework whereby those that enjoy um, gambling as part of their leisure and entertainment spend do so in a safe and regulated environment. And those that are at risk of harm are protected from that harm. And if it's new legislation or whatever the framework is, um, I think the main thing will be hopefully to use that as a vehicle to move to a little bit more of a stable environment where we understand the playing field, it's a good playing field, um, and then we can obviously look as an industry, I think, to um, to demonstrate that we are sustainable and that we're interested in delivering a sustainable uh, entertainment activity to customers in the UK. Right, thank you. Now, the, the, there are a lot of key reports published over the summer, which explored um, a range of different policy areas. Um, so I'd like to um, hear your views on some of the headline recommendations from, from whichever reports you do. Um, I think it's only right we start with, um, with Don and the, the Lord's legislative recommendation. Well, the, the, the House of Lords had a, a, a select committee which met for a period of just one year to gather evidence on the social and economic impacts of gambling uh, in the country. And at the end of that year, it produced a report which was supported by all members of the committee from across the party political divide. And it came up with over 50 recommendations for change that we believe needed to take place. And we identified many of those were changes that could take place without the need for introducing new uh, legislation in Parliament. We could use existing legislation and the powers of the Gambling Commission to make the changes that we wanted. Uh, and I would strongly urge everybody uh, uh, watching to have a look. It's very easy to find uh, at that Lord's report. Among the recommendations, and as I say, there were many of them, was a belief that we needed to look at regulating online games, um, you know, just taking those games that you can play uh, on the high street uh, are now to be found uh, on your smartphone, can be played 24-7, and yet don't have the same regulation surrounding them, something the Gambling Commission is now looking at. We think there needs to be testing for harm of all games that are introduced. Uh, we talked in the report about the contribution the industry itself should make towards the cost of research, education, and treatment, uh, and believe that we should continue with a levy, which we currently have, but it should become a mandatory levy. And if at all possible, it should be a smart one that uh, increases the amount you pay, depending on uh, the likely harm of the games that are being played. Uh, I could go through all of them. Uh, we will have an opportunity later to do that. Affordability checks, 
um, introduction of a gambling ombudsman, uh, regulation, as Matt was saying, of loot boxes and treating them uh, as gambling, uh, and also major reforms to the way in which we deal with the treatment of those uh, with uh, gambling problems. The starter for 10 for all of this is a recognition that in the UK there is something like a third of a million people who are problem gamblers, and among them, 55,000 who are children, and those with the problems, of course, affect the lives of very many other people, potentially uh, about 2 million people. And it leads to, as we sadly know on average, about one suicide per year. Now, those figures have remained relatively stable, uh, which is good, uh, but at need, they're nevertheless worryingly high, and we need to take action to address them. The Lord's report made a number of recommendations, and I'm delighted now to chair an organization with nearly 150 members of the House of Lords from all parties who are committed to work together to see the implementation uh, of those recommendations as quickly as possible, not just through the review, but for action that could be taken before the review work's finished. Great, and uh, Bridget, I'll come to you next in terms of, I know the DGC um, made some statements uh, when some of the reports came out. What were your sort of reflections or what was your reflections across I, the board? I mean, we welcome the Lords report. I thought it was, uh, I mean, as ever with the House of Lords, you've got re some real expertise. And I gave evidence to the Lords Committee with five chief executives of the biggest companies. And many of the recommendations are things that we agree with. And I agree with Don, we're not waiting for the review, we're getting on with a lot of this work. So we're doing a lot on affordability. We've done a lot on games design. We've introduced a, a VIP code or, or higher value customers code, which then the Gambling Commission has taken over and, and, and taken to a next stage. Uh, much of that we agree with an ombudsman. We think that affiliates should be licensed by the Gambling Commission. So there's much in that that, 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 that we recognise. Uh, let me just be clear about two things. First of all, I don't have any members that own or operate or have anything to do with loot boxes. So uh, loot boxes is certainly there, but it's not something that we have an interest in. I think the second thing to make clear is we, it would be almost impossible for you to sign up to an online account if you were under the age of 18. You know, the, 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 the age testing and age gating that we now go through would make that almost impossible. And actually, if you look at the figures of people, of young people, I mean, apart from the fact that obviously you can gamble on the National Lottery um, at 16 and you've got Category D machines, which are, 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 are for much younger people, most of what the gambling that goes on there is with uh, youngsters who are taking part in private bets and, 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 and doing things with their family. So just to be absolutely clear, we have zero tolerance in the BGC and within our membership of anyone who would offer or allow a child to gamble on anything that, that, that we might offer. Pat, do you want to come in there? Yeah, just I think one of the things that um, really stood out in the House of Lords report was the figure that 60% of the profits are coming from 5% of the customers and they're the customers who are most likely to be experiencing harm and what that suggests to me is when you have all these stories about what's happening with people who uh, lose more money than they can afford, who steal to fund their addiction, who have been given VIP status and flown around the world and uh, it's with money that, they, that they've stolen from other people or they've embezzled or whatever um it's not a surprise when you have a business model that is unfortunately it seems dependent on addicts losing more than they can afford and in that context where 60 percent of the profits come from five percent of the customers reduction in harm would mean reduction in profits it's quite a serious level so the industry is in a difficult position the industry doing things voluntarily will I don't think ever go far enough. I don't think they're. Com I think they're commercially bound. Mm -hmm. um, you know, their duty to their shareholders, uh, the, by the, the very nature of the, them being commercial companies, to self-regulate. They're very limited in in what they can do with self-regulation. So I think the review will hopefully level the playing field, and come up with some policies and procedures that actually are effective at reducing harm. I mean, one of the one of the measures that was uh, suggested by the Social Market Foundation was 
uh, 100 pounds a month soft cap so not 100 pounds a month limit on what you can gamble but a soft cap before enhanced affordability checks could take place and those affordability checks could in theory be overseen by uh, a public body an ombudsman or whatever um, and it would be good to see the industry the industry representatives engage with the substance of those sorts of proposals and uh, instead of kind of i think that was dismissed as nanny statism and and really if you look at where the public are on this stuff it's the public is they don't see this as nanny status they see it as perfectly reasonable and most people who are gambling safely uh gamble less than 100 pounds a month anyway so i do think it'd be good to see the industry engage with these proposals not, ha not having to implement them necessarily because i know that's difficult for them to do because of the commercial imperative but good to engage with those policies in a constructive way neil do you want to come in there and, and give you know what from your point of view, from an industry point of view, how did you read the Lord's report? Yeah, I think just to echo Bridget, it, you know, very welcome input, lots in there to um, acknowledge as good ideas and, and representing good progress to make. Um, I think just, just a couple of things I'd add is to address the point um, Matt's made there around, you know, the majority of profits coming from a minority of customers, we, we can't, um, assume that those that spend more um, are have a problem um, and that they're spending more because they've got a problem and i think that one misconception that's you know i think is uh sometimes dangerous uh that that can lead to the way the industry is perceived is that we absolutely have a financial incentive to ensure that um we're not making money from harmful sources we've got we've publicly stated an ambition of zero percent revenue from harmful gambling by 2023 ultimately we're a, we're owned by shareholders the, the shareholders for the you know in the majority of cases are pension funds they have very high bar in terms of the sustainability expectations that they have of businesses they invest in and whenever or if and when there is money made that shouldn't have been made from a revenue perspective that it's the costs of that revenue are far outweighed by then losing trust of shareholders of banks etc cetera, etc cetera. and the costs of profiting from harm are, are massively outweigh they do massively outweigh you know what any revenue that's been generated off you know obviously in uh, most cases that revenue gets returned anyway so there is no financial upside at all so I would just challenge the assumption that there's no incentive for the industry to engage in uh, moving to it to safer practices I, I actually think the complete opposite in that we are heavily incentivized to do so we will, we will be um, a much more attractive business that can uh, look to grow attract shareholder investment etc um, if we can demonstrate that we are 100% uh, safe and sustainable. Uh, and I think it's just good to probably just reinforce that there is that motivation from uh, all, all major operators um, to, to get to that point. Did, did anybody want to respond to that, Don? Yeah, yeah I, 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 I'm really sorry, Neil. Uh, I mean, I, I will accept the good intentions of you and the various um, uh, gambling uh, bodies within your portfolio. I'll accept from Bridget that, that your aim is to help in this endeavor. I will not accept uh, the uh, argument that says there is no incentive for gambling companies to benefit and profit from the harm that they're doing. That's what's happened. Why have we got so many problem gamblers in this country? I'm not saying it's worse than other countries. I'm not saying it's gone up, but we still have a very large number of them and we need to bring that number down. Uh, and if in the future you're saying that there's not going to be an intention to profit from that, fantastic. But that's going to require quite a lot of change to legislation um, uh, that's going to come down the track and obviously the sooner you can introduce that without even needing it the better but I have to say the track record to date has not been very good and when you get the vast majority of the profits of gambling companies come from just five percent of gamblers those with gambling problems then I think it, it, it's unarguable 
that to date the industry has to take its responsibility for creating that harm. Can I challenge this a little bit? Because I, I know there was discussions about those sorts of numbers, but I will be honest and say I took five CEOs who were absolutely clear from the boardroom down that they were absolutely committed to making changes. And we didn't set up the BGC saying we'd been wonderful in the past. We haven't. And actually, only in the last week, GVC is going to uh, re uh, be renamed. Their chief executive announced that actually they would be a safer gambling part of all the bonuses of all their staff going down from the top. And, and you know, we've, we've mentioned briefly Safer Gambling Week, which actually is launched today. That's not only about us raising awareness with the public and with consumers about this, but it's about individual companies within their own teams raising that awareness. So we're determined to make that change. I, it's, it's, it would be a very difficult thing, John, to legislate um, against. I know you could legislate in various areas, but I thought, think we've also got to be really careful that we don't all our, drive our customers then off to some black market, and I'm sure that's a subject that will come up later on. Uh, I, I mean, just very quickly, if I can respond, Bridget, I, I will accept entirely the good intentions of the industry. Uh, I, I am delighted that you've acknowledged publicly, you did it before the committee, that until recently you had not been best in class, uh, that there was a lot that was wrong, a lot that needed to change. That's what this whole debate is about, is what is the change that we should introduce that still enables those who wish to get pleasure from safe gambling are able to do so. This is not anti-gambling, it is about safe gambling, but there will be, as Matt rightly points out, ultimately there will be a clash between the two sides who will press very hard to make it safer and safer, which will in turn reduce the income for gambling companies. Okay, great. So I'm I'm going to move on and and get stuck into some of those proposed changes. Um, the the reviews expected to be quite broad, but um, if I could ask each of you um, where you'd like the focus to be, and maybe pick out you know we we picked on some of the policies issues such as advertising and loot boxes, um, but yeah, if you could just pick two or three to talk about, um, and we'll start with Matt. Where do you think the focus should be? Maximum stake on slots. Uh, I think there is it, it's very, very difficult to argue for a maximum stake on slots online that's not a parity with machines. Uh, minimum speed for casino games. Affordability. Did you say three? Um, mm -hmm. I, I think I'd like to. I'd like to also see treatment sorted out. I think. Um, you know, I, I, I think this, the, the levy the levy needs to be mandatory but it needs to be paid to a public body and I think the NHS needs to have more involvement in coordinating the delivery of treatment it can't just be left to like the whims of the industry to hand the money over to to gamble aware or whatever I think it has to be coordinated and it has to be part of the NHS long-term plan um yeah those are the areas I focus on uh, Neil do you want to pick up yeah, so I think like one one sort of broad point I'd make is that we're, as has been acknowledged, in a digital world now, and and maybe even perhaps that you know we need to stay open to new technologies, new platforms, as, as Matt said at the start. And and I think we have to acknowledge that in a digital world, customer experience is king, and customers will always go to wherever they're getting the best experience or the experience that they um, want. And you know, ultimately, if if what we want to get to is a point where those that enjoy gambling have uh, have the best experience on offer, and those that are at risk of harm are protected, um, we need to sort of consider the the holistic customer experience that that we create across all of the different individual topics that that are part of the review and, and part of the discussion. So I think it's good to focus on the individual topics, but also important to retain that um, more holistic view uh, overall because ultimately um, you know customers will go where where they're going to get what they want and and we are all I think aligned in wanting that to be in a regulated environment so that's sort of the, the overarching thing I'd say on that uh, and Don you meant you know 
without going through your recommendations, as you said, are there, are there one or two areas, priority areas that you see um, the government needs to focus on? Uh, I'm very loath to pick priority areas because I think all of the different aspects that, that are touched on in our report, been mentioned by others uh, as well, are, are all uh, important, um, whether it's uh, addressing the issue of grooming of children to gambling through loot boxes within video games that are currently not deemed to be gambling uh, and therefore not regulated as such is at one end really important. But, but broadly, MAPS 3 sort of pick the main boxes, which is dealing with the issue of, uh, of limits on stakes and prizes for online activity. But of course, we have to recognize that, that online is much more complicated. And I don't necessarily think it can be quite the equivalence of stakes and prizes uh, that, that we have in, in uh, the offline world, but something equivalent to, akin to that is definitely needed. The issue of affordability, which Bridget's already talked about, and I'm delighted the industry is working with the Gambling Commission to look at this. Um, and clearly, the sooner we can get some conclusions on that, the better. The issue of treatment, of course, is really important. If you, in the UK, if you've got uh, a drug addiction or an alcohol addiction, the amount of treatment that is available, while not adequate, is still significantly greater than it currently is for those people uh, with um, gambling addiction. So those things I think are really important. But let me just throw one other in uh, just to provoke um, a bit of debate from Neil and Bridget. I mean, one of the real issues is that we get a lot of uh, very positive things from the industry. Welcome all of that, keep saying it. Ultimately, it comes down to them taking responsibility uh, for their actions, uh, for their businesses, which is why I would like to see introduced, as we now have in a number of other sectors, the idea of a duty of care being imposed on the senior management in all individual gambling companies. Uh, and that then would give them a real incentive to make sure the activities of their companies are ones that are not going to lead uh, to problem gambling. Dan, can I pick up um, yeah. I, um, on these? Well, first of all, on the duty of care, I, mean, I had uh, Lord Gray gave me um, quite a good hard time at the committee on this subject. I, I mean, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not an expert. And Susanna Fitzgerald QC, who's somebody I have enormous amount of respect for, was very clear that she didn't think that that was the right way to go. I mean, obviously, we have license holders. Those licenses can be taken away within individual companies anyway. Matt, we've already introduced a 2.5 minimum speed on all games. That's come in as part of the uh, games design. So I think that bit has been dealt with. I, or it's not been dealt with, but we are making progress and there's more that we can do around game design as there is more that we can do about affordability and we are conducting a number of trials in that area. I mean, it's fascinating for me coming as I have from the alcohol industry. You know, for the last 20 years, the alcohol industry, if you have a problem with alcohol, it's been dealt with in the NHS. It has not been dealt with as far as gambling is concerned. In fact, the industry has been the sole funder. We give 10 million a year to gamble away and we probably put another 10 million. In fact, we do put another 10 million. We've got a report on it into all sorts of other uh, charities and, and, and YGAM. I mean, we've, we've announced 10 million to YGAM and, and, and Gamble Aware and Gam Care to do work around education. That's an Im important part of, of what we're doing. I visited one of the new, meant to be 22 NHS centres. I went to the one in Leeds. Um, I sat down with them. I mean, sadly, many of the issues that are faced by people with gambling are faced are people who've had problems in other areas as well. And, and, and they should rightly be dealt with within that NHS context. So I would very much um, support that. I think the other areas, and, and Neil has sort of uh, has looked at this, we, we know through the PwC report that 2% of people who gamble at the moment go to um, black markets, so they're not regulated, they don't play with our rules. If you look at somewhere like Sweden, they started off, they, uh, they interfered in the regulation of their particular market, and having had 90% of people who gambled within the Swedish market, it's now already dropped down to 75. So we've got to be really careful. This is not something like that 
if you go now onto uh, Google and you put in how to avoid GAM stock, which is the way that you can sign up to stop uh, taking part in any form of GAM activities, it will give you with 10 different ways. This is a worldwide web and in all the people, in people I've talked to who have had problems with gambling, you know, they've said they've got Curacao or wherever it is, preying on them all the time to take part in these activities. So, my plea in all of this is to come out with something that is proportionate, that actually creates a well-regulated market, but doesn't send people off to sites. Because as Neil said, the customer is key here. They've got to feel that they've got to have an experience, which is something that they can enjoy. And we have at one end of the spectrum people who have, who clearly do have issues, and we've got to make absolutely certain that we're not uh, preying on vulnerable people, hence the work we've done on advertising technology, the age gating we've now introduced on anything under the age of 25, unless you can prove you've got proper age gating for those under 18. So lots more work to be done, and a lot of those discussions are obviously going to take place as part of this review. Uh, Dan, sure. is it all right if I come back on that? Yeah, so I think I think the the increase in black market in Sweden actually correlates more with spell powder. So when they introduced spell powder, which was the uh, self exclusion register, exactly as you said, Bridget, people were googling what casinos are not on Gamstop. Why? Who would be googling that? It's people who are signed up to Gamstop, people who are addicted, who want to circumvent Gamstop. And this is what happened in Sweden when they had a self exclusion register, uh, and they introduced that, and it was effective. People who are addicted to gambling were trying to circumvent that by finding black market sites. Now, the solution to that is to introduce uh, mandatory blocking software. Now, I say, I say this, I declare an interest, I'm a co-founder of Gamban, but the blocking software blocks all the black market sites as well. And the Gambling Commission doesn't need more, I, I accept the point, the Gambling Commission, even though it's said that only, uh, it's only a small proportion of gamblers who, who access these black market sites, it does need more resources to deal with finding the IP addresses, blocking them, and blocking the payment processes. And I hope that that's part of the review as well. I mean, that, that should be something that the government's looking into too. Yeah, I, 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 I just pick up on that quickly. Oh, yeah, that, I think absolutely. that's a really good point Matt made at the end. Like this, the the issue of problem gambling is um, absolutely something that cannot be solved without the industry, but it, I don't think it can be solved by the industry in isolation. That there's so many other contributing factors, right? And uh, things like um, Gamban is, is, you know, we work with Gamban and, and we want to make sure that any customer that has an issue with gambling is uh, protected from gambling with us and others in the future. That's absolutely key that that happens. But I think it's not just those customers that look then to go to the black market. It, it's things like um, limits uh, that are either unable to be increased or difficult to, or too difficult for the customer to increase um, or ask something of the customer they're not prepared to do. Then customers who want to spend above those limits and can do so um, in a safe way also go um, offshore. So th there's a, there's obviously different aspects to to the black market problem. I think. So, uh... right. um, so, so my next question is is for for the, uh, Neil and Bridget, and it, it's in terms of um, we hear a lot from the BGC, but in terms of the industry and the operators themselves, how how do you think or how do you know they're approaching this review and this process, and and importantly what what lessons do you think the industry um, has learned from the FOBT debate? Um, well, if I, I start and, and, and Neil can come in, I, I, you know, we wouldn't have, the, the operators wouldn't have wanted to form the Betting and Gaming Council if he hadn't realised that that, uh, that it needed to learn lessons from FOBTs. And that was before my time. I only sort of watched as a sort of observer from the sidelines, if you like. But actually getting we're 90% of the betting and gaming industry in the UK. Getting them all to work together, I think is absolutely vital to this. And we're having a lots of discussions about how we approach this review. We have very clear uh, discussions with government um, on a regular basis. Um, we talk to the Gambling Commission on a regular basis. We see what the issues are and how we can work with them to, uh, to move them forward without the review. But inevitably, when faced with a review, there are going to be some things. You're not going to put all your cards on the table before you even start. You're going to have some of those discussions as, 
as the review goes forward. And the, there's, there's going to have to be uh, much that we uh, we look at. But I think the industry has learned. I mean, when I started the BGC, I think we had four people. We now have about 15 people uh, working with our organization. And they are people who are determined to make a difference, to bring the industry together. And I would say that all those companies, I have regular dialogue uh, with all my members. Um, we, uh, we invite them to uh, come to all our meetings. We've got a whole range of work streams that are, are that 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 are active, looking at everything from affordability to game design. Uh, that work will 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 absolutely continue. Yeah. Look, j just to I guess back back up that I think you know we welcome uh, the review. We're, we're ready, willing, able to contribute, um, and we're very keen to do so. Now, I think it, one uh, aspect of the re the reports that's come out um, is that there's, it's, there's so much more information around the debate now, and, and there's some really uh, well researched and, and good points that have been made. I think now there's also an opportunity for uh, the industry to both demonstrate um, that it wants to in improve standards and, and raise the standards and is doing so, uh, and, and get better at uh, explaining. Um, what we're focusing on and why we're focusing on it and why we believe that can also take us to a, a more sustainable uh, framework for the future you know i think there's so much has changed uh, in the industry in quite a short space of time um over the last couple of years and and i think one of the big things that has changed i appreciate i was challenged on this earlier that is the mentality like it is absolutely in um listed plc's interests uh, to move to an environment where uh, gambling is sustainable, safe, uh, and acknowledged as being so. Can, can I just come in and pick up one point that Neil said? Because people who are watching uh, this who come from uh, outside the UK may be quite surprised by how confident we are describing in some detail the various things that are going on, the changes that are needed, and so on. Uh, and, and you would assume that we had some fantastically good data on which we're making uh, all of these claims. The one thing I also hope will come out of the review, uh, or if, if possible, before we even finish the review, uh, is a clear commitment to conducting much more detailed research than we currently have. Because in a number of these areas, we are having to make decisions with very limited data, some of it quite out of date, and we're also having to be supported by a gambling commission who in the last few years have really uh, motored much more quickly than they perhaps have in the past, but having to do so with very limited resources, relatively small staffing, and of course the difficulty that the, the very brightest and uh, and most competent staff are very often uh, able to get higher salaries and go and work within the industry rather than within the commission. So the issue of data and the support for those people who are going to be engaged in coming up with recommendations for change, particularly the Gambling Commission, I think is very important. I actually think, uh, I mean, Don, you're absolutely right, but there is also an issue for government about how yeah. we share the data within companies. And I have been, I, I remember going to see several uh, ministers uh, before the one that we have now um, to talk about this problem. The information commissioner who DCMS regulates needs to sit down with the industry and see how we can share information because it's very difficult if Niels, for example, uh, can uh, actually stop somebody from gambling on their site. They can't can't share that information with other places in the industry. And uh, again, it's the same with banks. I mean, we are working very closely with banks. Banks now, you, all the major banks, you can actually stop spending on gambling uh, um, through, through the use of your cards, or certainly with anyone who's, who uses the right code within the, in the UK context. Um, but actually sharing information with us, with us and with individual companies who are not and are never going to be governed by the FSA sort of rules in terms of those disclosure but i think there's more we can do and gdpr regulations are not helpful to us in that area but that would of course bridget mean a requirement that you make a commitment that all of your members will make available more data as well to the researchers 
uh, anonymized data from gambling companies will be a crucial uh, component of the additional work that I think needs to be done. Yes, and actually the Gambling Commission requires all our companies to provide pretty detailed data on a regular basis. But I mean, it is one of the advantages of this industry. We are data driven. Um, you have lots of data about your customers. and It allows you to intervene more. And that is what we're also seeing is more interventions much earlier. I sat next to somebody ringing up a customer um, when they don't get a, a response, then they will stop that account while they're waiting for them to provide details. But also requirements, you've got to be very careful about how much they are required to provide with you, because if you're going to ask them to provide their sort of tax returns, then frankly, they'll say, we're not gambling anyone in the UK and we're going to go elsewhere. Now, I, I'm told we've got um, quite a few questions coming in, so I'm going to try and leave some time to, for you guys to answer some of those. Uh, but I just want to ask one quick question. Um, and we, you know, we talk, we've said that there's a lot of attention in this review from the public, uh, from politics, um, you know, from from all corners of society, really. And, and I've heard a couple of times already that um, we all want the same thing. Um, so where do you think there are areas for collaboration and cooperation throughout this process? And um, we'll get a map for that one. Well, I, I'm always, I, to be honest, I've been surprised with the degree of belligerence and intransigence that's come from some of the the industry's rhetoric. I'm, I've been surprised by that because I think, as you say, you know, there are there is a developing consensus now on the areas that need attention and the areas that need reform. And, and you know, the legislation is out of date. We're all, we're all agreed on that. Um, as the review's happening, everyone seems to be on board with that principle. So, yeah, you know, I've been surprised that when when things have been put forward, proposed. That you, you get the charge in any statism, even though that is, as I said before, pretty out of kilter with public opinion. I think that's the public are very much in favour of restrictive regulations. And to be quite honest, uh, I mean, we did we do this tracker polling. So in July, more people would sort of supported an outright ban on online gambling than would have opposed the ban. No, I think that's a terrible idea. So in terms of where we agree, we agree that there should be a legal industry that is regulated because that's best for the consumer. That's where we agree. Let's start from that principle and the principle that in order for it to be sustainable in the long term, it can't derive as much money as it's deriving from the small proportion of people that get addicted. Um, so, yeah, let's, we agree on that. We agree on the principle. So if that means limits to stakes online, Bridget mentioned the limits to the speeds on to speed on slots. That means limits to stakes as well. Let's look at that because that's what we have on machines. If that means, you know, restricting advertising in some way, let's look at that. Uh, I think that there's there is common ground that can be found, but I, I hope that the industry engages. Like I'm, I, we stand ready to engage. We're always happy to engage. But with the, as I say, we've been very surprised at the level of kind of belligerence. I think in the in the rhetoric. That's all. Richard, do you want to respond to that? I'm not aware of any belligerence, and there certainly hasn't been. Uh, um, from me in anything that we've uh, ever said about this. I I, I think. Matt, you have to be, let's be absolutely realistic here. This is going to be part of the discussions with government with the review. They've announced they're going to have this review. We want to get on with it. There will be a call for evidence where everyone will put in their own ideas. And then there will be a view on where we go from there. And I, and, and I think we we'll just have to wait a little longer while those discussions go on. But in the meantime, we continue with all the groups that we've got, with, uh, with, which are set up, and we continue to announce things on a, on a, on a regular basis. So I, I don't think we're being belligerent, and nor have I said, certainly aren't suggesting that this is nanny statism. I think it's really important that this is a properly regulated industry and where there are problems that we deal with them and that we then move on. Uh Don, did you want to come in that that point? Look, uh, I, I mean, there is no doubt whatsoever. The evidence is very clear that if you went back four or five years ago, the industry were belligerent to anybody who proposed any measures whatsoever that would have restricted gambling activities in this country. That is indisputable. Uh, as one who is very heavily involved in the uh, fixed odd betting terminal reduction of stake campaign. I was the first parliamentarian to raise it in 2010 when I first proposed it. 
I was absolutely slaughtered uh, by uh, the industry. I know from other work I've done how difficult it's been. If there is now a change of tone, and if it has come about because the industry is deeply concerned that a lot of change is going to come down the track and they better get in there to protect them, or if they're doing it out of their goodness of their heart, frankly, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that the industry is now beginning to work much more cooperatively with uh, outside bodies, is working much more effectively with the Gambling Commission and through the review, I hope, with the government there will inevitably be areas of big difference ultimately but you know i welcome the fact that there is closer cooperation the fact that everybody's coming at it from dip for different reasons um from different starting points and with different endpoints that they might wish to achieve doesn't alter the fact that it's far better to do it trying to work together cooperatively uh, than it is to have the belligerence that matt I, you know, you're a hundred percent right. It was appalling a few years ago. Things have changed for the good. I'm pleased. And, and Neil, just quickly, have you got um, anything to add? And then I think Eva's going to uh, jump in with a few questions from um, attendees. No, I think hopefully that was a uh, that was a, a, a positive nod towards good sentiment for moving forward. So. Great. So I am actually going to stay on the topic of collaboration because we have an interesting question here from one of our international international viewers. And the question uh, is as follows. Uh, does UK look at other regulations to adapt their law? And would it uh, not make sense to set up an international expert group of regulators to define, define best practice in all key areas? And, and another kind of question from the same person um, as a follow up, is UK aware um, that what they change now will have quite an impact on other jurisdictions, such as advertising or credit ban already uh, being discussed in Spain? Um, and perhaps, I don't know, maybe uh, Neil or, or Bridget would like to comment first. Um, can I pick this up? Because, um, I mean, yes, there is enormous international collaboration that goes on. The Gambling Commission has always uh, um, been talking to regulators around the world. So I don't think there's anything uh, different here. I mean, I think here in this country, I actually chair meetings with the other trade associations that work in this area, back to bingo, back to bingo uh, and the um, um, gambling and business uh, organisations. I think it's going to be really important that we work together. And to be honest, that hasn't been uh, great in the past, which is, 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 is why that's important. Um, but no, I, the regulation, regulatory discussion goes on around the world. And yes, we want to be best in class and to be setting standards around the world. I think that's an important part about what we all want out of this gambling review. Neil, a comment from you? Yeah, look, I think it's, you've always got to look at what works in other jurisdictions, what, what isn't working in other jurisdictions. But yeah, I think the, the review is an opportunity for the UK um, government, hopefully, to be aspirational about getting to a set of regulations and a framework that puts customer experience in the digital age at the very forefront of, of what enables the customers that enjoy gambling to do so in a regulated environment and protects those that are at harm. I think if we can get to that point, then the UK will be setting standards uh, globally and, and it will be the benchmark of, of, of how to regulate in a digital world. Thank you. And uh, Don, can I also ask you for, uh, for commentary? Are you aware of Kind of the impact that uh, your work is having uh, in terms of policy making uh, on other jurisdictions as well. Well, look, I mean, first of all, on on international cooperation, um, can I just confirm, as everybody else has done, that there is a great deal of that that goes on. Could there be more? Probably there could. Um, we have to remember that uh, for a very long time, the UK uh, had allowed. Uh, gambling companies that were regulated in some so-called whitelisted countries uh, to be able to advertise here as well. So we we had to rely on you know the regulators of those companies in those countries. Um, changes have been made in recent time to that, but um, you know there is a lot of cross cooperation going on. Second thing to bear in mind is that look any changes that take place 
will have consequences. The consequences that we're looking for is a consequence that reduces the amount of harm caused by gambling, that reduces the number of gambling-related suicides, that reduces the number of people who have gambling uh, addiction, the no number of children who are currently being uh, registered and tr considered to be gambling addicts. That's what we're aiming to do. There will inevitably con be consequences uh, along the track for those changes, inevitably. If, for example, we were to ban uh, advertising of gambling companies within football, clearly that has a huge knock-on effect on the income uh, into football. If you look at the, in the English context, our lower league clubs are in huge financial difficulty at the present time. Huge financial difficulty because of uh, the lockdown, COVID, no fans going to games and so on. So clearly any changes that take place in that direction have got to be thought through very carefully and take account of those consequences. But, you know, the start of a 10 should be what do we want to achieve and how can we do it in a way that enables people to be able to continue to gamble safely? Uh, and if we can find a way of doing that to everybody's satisfaction, that would be great. I suspect it won't be to everybody's satisfaction. There will be some reduction in business, some loss of income to people like football clubs and so on. Uh, that, that, and we have to balance out those consequences. But, but Don, there is, there is one way of dealing with this, and you mentioned whitelisting. At the moment, we have only two Premier League clubs are sponsored by members of the BGC. Uh, the rest of the six are by companies who have no interest in the UK market. And, and I'm actually chairing a sports sponsorship group which is looking at all of these things. One of the things we want to do is to tighten up that. I think when you put uh, safer gambling at the heart of all your agreements. And uh, you mentioned the lower leagues. Uh, one of our members is sponsoring the Trident lead at the moment. There is no information about their company on it, but they are providing grassroots sports information. And we talked briefly, Dan, at the beginning about Safer Gambling Week. If you want to watch football over this weekend in the championship, so if you're going to watch Fulham Everton uh, on Sunday on the BBC, you will see Safer Gambling Week or in all of those areas, which is very clearly about raising awareness. It's something we do 365 days a year, but we have got a week that we're doing it uh, now. And there's much more information on the Safer Gambling website for you to look at there. Um, but, thank but, you. Bridget, sorry, just come back to Bridget, because it's really important. I welcome uh, the change that has been made in terms of marketing uh, but recently. Of course I welcome, I don't think they go far enough. But ultimately, the fact is that the reason why a commercial organization, and that's what gambling companies are, do marketing is to increase the size of the market and it is to increase their market share. Now, we can be told that in addition to doing that, they send out safer gambling messages and all of those things. But let us not lose sight of the obvious fact that the only reason that such vast sums of money are put into marketing, billions of pounds are put into marketing, is to get more people gambling and to grab more of the gambling market for your particular company. End of story. It cannot be disputed. But I'm not disputing that. But what I would say is that would be true of any product. Um, and then yeah. you make a decision about what you're going to do and what it is that you want to buy and support. I mean, that's and, and one of the things we welcomed in the Lord report, and you've already mentioned it, is that we need to see more evidence because at the moment there isn't any real evidence that links advertising and sponsorship with real with people having a problem. And I think that's one of the things I'm sure the review uh, will look at. That. We will welcome it. But as somebody who's passionate about sport, and you know, Don, I've worked in sport for many years, I do not want to turn off the financial support that's given to sport because it's used in their communities it's used in education staff it's used in educating players about what the rules are and i think it's part of the awareness that we need to have but i do accept your point great thank you um, we need to move on uh, we did have some more questions um for example on financial services and data sharing but I believe, uh, Bridget, you addressed those um, already. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, let uh, Dan kind of uh, 
uh, close uh, close uh, close the panel from my side uh, i wanted to say uh, thank you to to you for uh, being part of the session and also to our audience uh, for participating throughout uh, the three days uh, please remember uh, our coverage of uh, consumer protection doesn't stop uh, today and actually it starts <laughs> uh, with the editorial uh, coverage uh, that is aligned with the uk safer gambling week uh, and then over to you uh, to uh, close up great and, and and thanks again it's been a really interesting hour and just to finish i'm going to give you your 30 seconds um just 30 seconds of advice to the secretary of state really um as as, as the uh review is launched um yeah matt do you want to start what would you say to the secretary of state i'd say look at the evidence i would say uh let's try to future proof the legislation and uh, I would also say that, as, is, as has been mentioned before, people are looking to Britain and how we regulate online gambling. We're one of the, the biggest and most mature markets in the world, if not the biggest. And uh, if we get it right, then it will make positive waves across the world too. Neil? Yeah, I'd say double down, focus on the evidence. Um, and also, like I've said a couple of times, uh, let's try to get to a point whereby the best and safest customer experience that's available to someone in the UK that wants to gamble is a regulated one uh, so that we can ensure that the safety uh, is there and we can also ensure that all of the economic benefit that the industry can generate uh, we maintain and, and, and you know grow that in the future. And Sam, 30 seconds. Uh, very simply, uh, Secretary of State, don't let this review, welcome though it is, in any way, shape or form, become an excuse for delaying actions that could be taken over the next couple of years. Uh, and finally, Bridget. Action will continue by the industry. I think that's really important. But my advice to the Secretary of State has got to be we want it to be proportionate, balanced and listen quite very carefully to real evidence. Great. Well, uh, that, that's the end of the session. Um, um, and thank you for Clara for putting this on and thank you all for contributing. Um, it's been a really interesting hour. So thanks everyone. Thanks, Dan. Thank you.